Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is Matt Berkowitz. I'll be a co-host for today's edition of TZM Global Blog Talk Radio, and my other host is the wonderful Ben Klish. Say hi, Ben. Hello, sir, and thank you for employing that wonderful epithet of wonderful. That's very nice. I guess I, uh, you owe me one for me calling you lovely at our last town hall. <laughs> uh, I think you're absolutely right about that. <laughs> um, so today, uh, the topic is morality, uh, more specifically, the idea of a science of morality. Um, it's, uh, it's actually going to be a topic that I'm talking about at, uh, at Z-Day Global in Toronto. So I just wanted to do sort of a preliminary radio show about these, these ideas, because I don't think it's really covered that extensively in the Zeitgeist Movement's literature and the, you know, the train of thought that we promote. Um, on the one hand, you know, morality is often often a, a, something like law, you know, it's, it doesn't really get at the heart of, of, of root causality, the, the problems in our society. They tend to be ideas or, or, you know, we think of a moral code as something that you have to place on top of a, of a system structure. And of course, in the Zeitgeist Movement, we talk about uh, structures in our society being what we should focus on in terms of, um, you know, how we want to get the right behavior and the values uh, to go in, in in line with, you know, natural and sustainability issues. So, but with morality, um, it's it's quite a touchy subject. I mean, a lot when you when you bring up morality, at least I I think when you bring up morality, there's two two ideas about morality that tend to be the dominant ones in our society. And I don't know if you want to let me know if you agree with me or not. But from my research, it seems like. There's either one, there's an objective morality that has been, you know, ordained from, from, from God or from a religious scripture. And people who subscribe to this notion of objective morality, they tend to just reference one authoritative book or one authoritative ideology as, as what is considered moral or immoral. And on the other side, which is completely the opposite, I suppose, is the idea of moral relativism. The idea that something is only right depending on the culture that you're in, which means that there is no objective or universal right and wrong. There's just whatever the culture thinks about. It. I don't know if you want to chime in there, Ben, and add some thoughts as to what, 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 what springs to mind when the idea of morality is brought up. I always like to go back to how I used to think about this. Um, I used to actually be a Christian, and I used to also entertain the idea of moral relativism. So I'll let you work out whether there's any <laughs> attempted uh, congruency between those two things. Um, I do agree with you. I think there's actually a third type as well, but it's essentially the same as your first, and that's just a, a very more a more specific application as, as a, <clears throat> a defense of the state. Very often, morality is the claimed shared values of a society. Uh, it's how you ought to be feeling. Uh, rather than how it is natural for a human to feel uh, with respect to physical violence, with respect to uh, the prospect of longevity of life versus um, a curtailed, miserable life and all the rest of it. It is almost how you are enjoined to feel, which it, it chimes in with your religious point, but it's, out, it's applied in a different way, I suppose, um, more towards um, keeping the, the group together rather than the so-called stated objective of uh, religious aim for personal purity and um, the, the good life and to be at one with the almighty creator and all the rest of it. What's interesting about moral relativism is I used to believe that that was the all-inclusive way of looking at it, going, well, you know what, we should, we should entertain everybody's uh, and, and, and at least understand everybody's different viewpoints. For example, in Iran, where people have their uh, hands cut off, or even worse, in Saudi Arabia, where uh, women are stoned to death for having been raped by men uh, deliberately. <clears throat> Um, as, as, as ill-fitting uh, as those appear to what we like to de determine as the Western mindset, I used to believe, oh, well, wh who are we to say anything about um, that kind of stuff? Um, now, of course, you and I have both um, uh, had a look at Sam Harris's work, The Moral Landscape, which um, I first actually came across through the various TED Talks and the other one, the stuff on Fora TV, actually, is a particularly strong uh, where he talks about can science determine human values, and it seems we are almost trained to think that those are two separate things, aren't we? We think that on one side there is the absolutely knowable, or at least that which is verifiable, independently verifiable, which if you look at moral relativism, it couldn't be because we are deliberately trying to conflate and equalize two or three or multiple very different sets of ideologies, 
on one side, the physical violence towards women. Uh, on the other side, the discarding of uh, newborn females in China. On the other side, I don't know, for example, the continuous warring uh, that we do for oil in the West. I mean, we, we are all <clears throat> at fault in some way. Um, but if you uh, read Harris's work, and I maintain also as well, actually, another one which I mentioned in the uh, description of this show, Stephen Pinker's work on how, why physical violence, he doesn't call it that, but it is essentially physical violence, why that has declined. You, you come to realize quite quickly, and I, I hope this is where you'll go, and this is where I'll pass the baton to you next, uh, that it is the slow increase in what we know and the evidence we have gathered about how we feel, how others could feel, how it is that we know how others can feel, um, and uh, the slow understanding of the unfolding of life and, and what is um, good for public health, what is good for the ecosphere, what is good for uh, how neuroscience works, is in fact the engine behind how our morality has changed and how the, as I think Harris actually puts it in his book, the elasticity of morality um, can be, uh, has actually, where that actually has come from. I'll pass it back to you, sir. Definitely, that's a good point, and uh, I think could go on that uh, on that route of discussion in a moment. I think we should discuss Harris's work a little bit uh, more. So, with uh, with Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape book, he's basically challenging those two notions of morality that I brought up. That uh, uh, you know, rejecting the idea of a of a uh, of a religion just objective morality, which isn't really a system of morality when you think about it. They're more proclamations about what is moral. They're not, they're not systems that tell you how to arrive at what is the moral truth. They just say, you know, they just reference a book, and if a book um, approves or disapproves of an action, it's deemed to be moral or immoral. Uh, whereas moral relativism uh, might do a system for how to determine what is good or not within a culture, but it, it, it's a uh, it negates upon the, this, that system uh, universally to, to other cultures, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you break this a little bit. So uh, what Harris goes into is the idea of a secular objective morality, basically a science of money. And I guess we need to define our terms here because uh, semantics is, is a big issue here when talking about morality. Um, I think it would be fairly uncontroversial to say that if we were going to define morality in any meaningful way, it would have to do with the, as Harris denotes, the well-being of conscious creatures. You know, you look up in the dictionary what morality means, and it has to do ideas about what is right or wrong, or good and bad, you know, good and evil. Um, and that, of course, always relates to the well-being of conscious creatures. Um, I, I don't understand any definition that doesn't have to do with that. Just like, you know, if we look at the definite physics, we will ultimately arrive at a definition that has to do with understanding uh, facts about the, the physical world, the mechanics therein. If someone were to define physics as, you know, an arbitrary religious notion that uh, tries to isolate, uh, you know, the physics of uh, a thousand-year-old theology with modern physics as we understand it, that, that person doesn't get to participate in the discussion in any meaningful way, right? So we can just discard it. Just like if you think Morality has to do with removing the eyeballs of every third child, as, as Harris likes to bring up as one of his examples. That's just not morality, and we're talking about something different. I'll tell you a little story. I was at a conference a few years ago talking about the link between morality and human well-being, as I'm going to tonight. And I said something that I thought would be quite uncontroversial in this context. I said, listen, we know that morality relates to human well-being. We know that human well-being relates to the facts that allow mind to emerge in the brain, and, and uh, so it's constrained by, by truth claims in some sense. And therefore, we know that certain cultures are wrong about how to maximize human well-being, and therefore, they are, they're wrong in terms of what they value. And I cited as an example uh, life, under the, life for women, especially, under the Taliban. Uh, it seemed to me you know, their violent misogyny and religious lunacy was, was a pretty obvious context in which people, especially women, were not thriving. <clears throat> now, it turns out to denigrate the Taliban at a scientific conference is to court controversy. Uh, 
And so after I spoke, a, 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 another speaker came up to me and said, well, how could you ever say that the compulsory veiling of women is wrong from the point of view of science? And I said, well, okay, the moment you link questions of right and wrong to questions of human well-being, then it seems pretty clear that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is not a way of maximizing well-being and therefore not a good practice. And she said, well, that's just your opinion. I said, okay, well, let's just make it easier. Let's imagine we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of every third child. Okay, would you then agree that we had found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? And she said, it would depend on why they were doing it. Okay. So that after I picked my jaw back up off the floor, I said, okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. And you'll be pleased or horrified to know that she just bit the bullet here and said, then you could never say that they were wrong. This was a woman who has a background in science and philosophy. She's now on the president's council for bioethics. She's one of 13 people advising our president on all of the issues related to progress in medicine and life science generally. Um, she had just delivered a totally lucid lecture on the moral implications as she saw them for, for the use of neuroscience in our courts. She was, she was very worried that we have been developing lie detection technology and that we are using this on captured terrorists. And she, she viewed this as an invasion of cognitive liberty. Okay, so on the one hand, her, her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to our own possible missteps, in, in this case, in our war on terror. But she was rather sanguine about the, the ritual enucleation of children. Uh, and it seemed to me terrifyingly detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So this kind of impossible juxtaposition of views uh, is something I'm encountering a lot now uh, among disproportionately well-educated uh, and liberal people. So it's, it's, um, it's something we have to grapple with. So if we agree that morality has to do with the well-being of conscious creatures, we also have to acknowledge that there are better and worse ways that we can act or design our society that brings out uh, better or worse uh, measures of human well-being, right? I mean, no one would dis uh, disagree, I hope, with the notion that there are better and worse ways to treat physical health ailments. You know, if someone has a heart attack, there's, you know, there are worse ways to deal with that, uh, like going out and eating as many bacon cheeseburgers as you can. That would probably be worse than, uh, you know, having a bypass surgery and maybe changing your diet. I find that news to be a great disappointment, but if, uh, please carry on. <laughs> Sorry to, uh, first of all there. Um, so there are obviously better and worse ways that we can act with respect to how this is going to, how, how human health is going to flourish. And it's actually a really good analogy for well-being. I mean, you know, health is, is a broad term that could refer to many different things, you know, and, but it's, it's, it's always changing. We're discovering more about how to treat uh, human health. It doesn't mean that there aren't better and worse ways with respect to the information that we have at a particular time. And so, you know, same thing with, with morality. Um, another, another ingredient of the thesis is is that our goal has to be to maximize well-being. If our goal as a species is not, you know, is something else, is, is if it's not to maximize human well-being, if it's not to improve the world's state of affairs, um, then there's no point really in the conversation, right? I mean, obviously, I'm sure everyone listening to this podcast is, is, is attempting to do better in the world. So hopefully we can align with this idea that if our goal is to maximize human well-being, uh, then there are right and wrong ways in which we can proceed with respect to reaching that goal, and and one of the and, and I guess that can go into the realm of where you, you're talking about uh, Steven Pinker's work, and of course also where you know what we talk about in the Zeitgeist movement in terms of a resource-based economy. How I see it is that if you follow Sam Harris's thesis of the moral landscape to its logical conclusion, 
you will have to talk social redesign because ultimately we're talking about social systems here that will increase or decrease uh, well-being. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree completely. Actually, it, there's a, quite a striking moment. I wish I knew the page number. I will find it. Um, where um, Harris talks about the, um, <laughs> the 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 lessening of the human experience to tragedy as the number of humans involved increases. So uh, one person's suffering and tragedy, usually a lone child, really strikes the world. There are examples of this. Um, a course within our history. There was a very, very awful earthquake and flood back in the 80s, I think it was, where a young girl was trapped basically at head height in the water. And she was trapped in a kneeling position under a girder, which meant that her legs were wrapped around underneath her in a way that meant that she couldn't uh, but hold up. And eventually she, she passed out after several days of being broadcast around the world. And her plaintive eyes really strike you. And you can still find this stuff on YouTube. This, of course, really, really strikes. Um, we had the same thing happen um, in the UK uh, yesterday. Uh, there was a, 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 a young child called Mikhail Kula who went, went missing and has now been found dead in Edinburgh. Um, and it's, of course, um, hit the national papers completely. It's hit it more than all of the drone strikes and uh, the huge suicide attack that happened in, um, I believe it was Afghanistan today, um, where we know 30 or 40 people died, um, including many people who are out trying to make the world a better place. Now, it's already probably striking the listener as almost rude to compare the two, um, because, of course, isn't it, isn't it so much worse with the child, isn't it? Uh, it starts to kick in immediately because we have this lessening effect. And in fact, of course, if you follow that to its logical conclusion, uh, the death of millions um, then strikes one not with the same proportion as a million times that story of the child slowly drowning in the 1980s. Um, and he actually, Sam Harris mentions this and talks about, I think the, the, the neuroscientist is called Green. Um, his name is, is, is the, the, the study was done on that. And he says, based right. on this, based on the fact that the human mind behaves this way, and that we understand that it does that now, it only makes sense that you redesign the society to build in the, uh, the, the, the well-being of the conscious creatures within that society. And that is really all you need, because if you are going to be plaintive and depressed about a single human being, you may not be unimpressed by more. Um, and if we know that through no fault of our own, but maybe only the limitations of the way that our mindset has developed as our brain has, and that we have a problem with those kinds of scales, um, and then, in fact, the, the, the emotional concomitant response would be too much to deal with. Given that we understand that we are limited in that way, it seems the only grown-up thing to do to actually design the society to take care of that falling short of our own, if you like, innate morality. I wouldn't say innate morality in many other ways other than in that way, which is that we, we seem to have that short falling. So that really struck me. I heard it again today as I was reviewing for the show, and I thought, wow, it seems so obvious once it's been said that we... Once we understand that in a non-judgmental way, it's not you should be feeling awful about the millions. It's we can't necessarily feel accurate about the millions. But obviously that must be bad because we do feel the pain and responsibility for one or two or maybe even a group of 10. So um, I, I would thoroughly agree with you that uh, that it's there. Matt, let me ask you, and we wanted to start here, but I think we've laid a decent groundwork now. What do you think the dominant moral framework of now is? Hmm. It's a difficult question to try to paint the entirety of humanity as following one moral framework. I think there is one. I mean, in the Middle East, you have the fundamentalist Muslim sense of, quote, morality, which I wouldn't call morality at all. You know, it's more like following traditional customs that are have been bred into the culture as being right or wrong. And then you have, I suppose, a more liberal Judeo-Christian morality in, in in Europe and in North America, although the United States still is it's very primitive in many respects with, you know, through the uh, Christian organizations promoting, uh, you know, anti-abortion and, and anti-gay marriage. Uh, and that's supposed to be moral. I mean, if again, let's go back to the definition of what morality really relates to. It's, it's well-being of conscious creatures. Can they really trace back? Um, you know, whether banning gay marriage is going to negatively affect all of human, you know, human, human well-being. It's just ridiculous. I mean, obviously, if you have supernatural beliefs in there that you're going to inject into the equation, I think you could, uh, th they would attempt to justify how 
yes, I mean, that is going to, you know, poison humanity in some sense. But on any on an empirical level, obviously, it's nonsense. Um, I, I know I haven't really answered your question concretely, but I don't think there's one morality that uh, people are inculcated with. I think it's more relevant, though, to talk about what what morality actually is rather than what people think it is. It's just like, again, I brought up physics or chemistry. Uh, and, and Sam Harris talks about this a lot before. You know, we used to think of these sciences as, you know, there's uh, Muslim physics and Jewish physics and Christian physics. But now we just talk about physics, right? Nobody disagrees with the fact that there are uh, objective facts to be known about uh, physical laws of the universe. And I think so, so too, will morality be thought in this way eventually. It's, um, you know, we, we still think in terms of uh, Republican morality. The Jewish morality, Christian morality, postmodern morality. Eventually, it'll just be morality because facts that relate to the well-being of con conscious creatures are objective. I mean, we might not know them, and this is a, a, a side point that we might want to get into. In principle, there is a right and a right and wrong, or better and worse. In in practice, it might be more difficult to deduce. Um, and then you know there are, there are these age-old moral philosophical conundrums that you can bring up, such such as you know, if there are, uh, say there's a, that you're standing next to a train track and there's uh, four people who are about to be, uh, you know, run over by a train um, and you have a, a switch in front of you and you can decide whether to flip that switch on or off. And if you flip it on, uh, only one person, uh, you know, only one, a different person, but one person dies. If you choose not to flip the switch, uh, all four die. Uh, and most people would say, yeah, I'd flip the switch because you have a, a net of three lives that you're saving. But if you if you slightly change the uh, the question to be, well, now there's no switch, but there's a human being that you can push in front of the train track and you still have a, a net three lives. <laughs> um, but this time now that you have to push someone in front of the uh, in front of the train. Now, people hesitate a lot more to. To acknowledge that second second point, they they, they tend to not want to do that. Um, people say, "Hey, look, well, you know, there's a there's a problem there. How how are we going to use science to determine that?" I'm like, "Well, there are other there are other ingredients of the puzzle to consider there, such as, you know, the the trauma that'll be induced by that one person or by the by the person doing the pushing." Um, and then there's another conundrum of, you know, say. There are six people in a hospital, and they're each missing different organs. Uh, and without them, they're going to die. And uh, say there's, you know, being in the in the waiting room, each and, and they have each one of these each one of these body parts, or these or these organs that uh, that the other people need. Um, I mean, technically, you could just harvest this person and give everyone a, a transplant of each of these organs that they need to survive. You're going to be saving a net five lives, but on the other hand, would you want to be living in a society where at any moment, you know, your your body can be harvested for, you know, just because you're going to save more people? So these are interesting physical conundrums, and they're not really relevant to the question here. They're worth considering for their difficulty in answering. But uh, this is to illustrate the difference in uh, principle versus practice. In principle, there are right and wrong answers, even if we can't deduce them. Uh, in practice, they may be more difficult. Yeah, you've, oh. you've sent me on a few different interesting points there. On the point of uh, gay marriage and how it may affect things, you may have heard of uh, a British party called UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Uh, even the word independence is a fallacy there. We're on one planet. There is no independence. But quite recently, there was a councillor uh, from Oxfordshire who said, and I think you've seen this, <laughs> he said that the, gay, the uh, legalization of gay marriage in the UK was directly to blame for the uh, resulting floods <laughs> and deaths in Oxfordshire, which um, <clears throat> has led some of our membership, uh, the, the gay quarter of our membership, to be pleasantly surprised by the newfound power that they appear to have over the global population. <laughs> um, <laughs> of, of course, it can be got, off, it got, got rid of quite quickly. Um, we obviously know there's no cause and effect between the two, hence it's not even a moral question. Um, What's interesting about your point about throwing the man on the tracks to save the net three lives is, and, and Harris mentions this point, and in fact, it's mentioned every time by anybody who quotes this, 
is that a lot of people burn a lot of brain fuel on whether the man would be heavy enough to stop the train from killing the people. <laughs> we, we love to um, uh, quantify things and we love to uh, really turn these things over. Like you say, these are interesting exercises. Um, I don't normally cite my own work, mostly because it's amateur at best, but I will cite something here and it was from Z Day 2013, which of course I had the pleasure of um, uh, hold, holding with you yourself in, um, in Los Angeles. Um, where I had to make the point, I think, in the interview leading up to it, that in the Victorian times, people died at around 47, or at least below 50, and very often of a cut or a graze or their teeth because of the resulting infection, which was as yet untreatable. Now, these days, uh, that uh, to die at 50 would be a great tragedy for many people of something so, well, um, pathetic, <laughs> of something that was so treatable. Uh, in fact, it seems almost morally reprehensible to deny such, quote, basic treatments to the human body now, which should lead the, uh, the listeners to hopefully to make the point that I've just only realized about public health itself, which is, is it's only really viewable in retrospect. Um, and Harris mentions this in a roundabout way in his own book as well. He says, the fact that we don't know where we're going about the development of medicine what it might yield in terms of longevity of life or resulting cures or, or the dropping of suffering shouldn't limit our search uh, and shouldn't make moral questions more difficult, uh, that we can only analyze those things in retrospect and say, wow, wasn't it terrible that uh, in Victorian times and before people died in their 40s and 30s, mostly of dental problems, which are now, what, 20, 30 pounds to fix and uh, not even a matter of money, but in fact a matter of dental understanding or understanding about um, hygiene or about um, uh, virology or everything else. So things become morally required <laughs> that before were considered, quote, impossible. Now, members of our movement and anybody who has tried to fight for a better world is already probably writhing in their chair because how many times have they been told that what we're asking for is utopian or impossible? or that the idea of the world working together and absolutely maximizing our technical understandings of everything and unifying uh, the world in a very, very basic set of presets to do with um, just interoperability, really, of almost everything, is, quote, impossible or unrealistic or, and this will be my final point before I hand back to you, not worth doing. Uh, that right. you can't say uh, that the re reduction of suffering is per se a good thing. Now, what's interesting is that people who make that argument usually also compare us to Hitler, which they may not do if they don't think suffering is a bad thing, because the only reason they're quoting Hitler is presumably because they want to mitigate the suffering of countless further murdered um, uh, marginal or even uh, uh, majority portions of uh, a society. But that doesn't necessarily follow that they're making both arguments. However, if you find people doing that, saying, well, who are you to say what's right? And you're just like Hitler. Then they've essentially done what they've just told you not to do. Um, but this, this has become very evident to me is that um, it's a tricky thing to argue forwards because we, of course, can't prove the future just yet. But we can go on the general tangent of the past and see that the great, as I said at the beginning, the great engine of, of moral change the great benefits in the well-being of conscious creatures, as, as Harris likes to say, um, is, is in fact furthered by uh, the very technical understanding and, and not, as you like to say, as, as you did right at the beginning, the sort of superimposed uh, moral system, something like libertarianism is for the Austrian school or indeed any form of capitalism that's trying right. to stick under the radar. Uh, it's sort of, uh, there's all these things that are market forces that are, that are absolutely required and are irrefutable. And by the way, uh, they're also moral because wouldn't it be nice to have this set of, of, of things about non-aggression and all the rest of it sort of superimposed. In fact, it works very much the other right. way around. Uh, all the benefits, or at least the great number of benefits that we've seen uh, come very much from the actual immutable laws of the universe, which is the, 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 the human mind's technical understanding and the leveraging of our great technologies and sciences, including the human sciences. It's not just cold science and machines and, and whirring server rooms. This is the understanding of how we understand as well. I'll pass back to you, sir. Right, yeah, you made a bunch of great points in there. Uh, um, one thing to do is clarify the, the difference between um, objective morality and absolute morality. Uh, now, absolute morality I would reject because it basically says that something is always wrong. You know, like say it's always wrong to stab someone or you take a knife and, and stab them in the stomach. Right. 
well, that would probably be wrong 99% of the time or whatever the percentage is. Maybe if they need an emergency appendectomy, that would be right, right? But um, what we're talking about here is, is a moral landscape where, uh, like you said, at, at, the, at the lowest end of the moral landscape, uh, Harris denotes, you know, it's the worst possible misery for everyone. You know, all you have to do is grant that suffering is bad. I mean, no one likes to suffer. If you say that you like to suffer, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and it just, it just goes against the very def definition of suffering. Suffering means to, you know, dislike the state that you're in, being in some sort of pain. You know, you could say that you like pain if you're some sort of sadomasochist, but that's, that's slightly different from, uh, from suffering. Then you wouldn't be suffering. You'd be in pain but enjoying it. So that's, that's the worst possible end of, 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 uh, of the moral landscape. Uh, and then, of course, there are many different peaks and valleys a lot that you could, that we could reach. Um, maybe there are certain peaks that are that are equally good. Then then it wouldn't really matter which one which one we chose. Uh, they would both be moral equivalents, so to speak. So the difference between uh, objectives is absolute morality. Is ob an objective morality is more like situational ethics. We take a given situation, we evaluate the consequences. And what uh, you know, the net positive or negative effect is on all of humanity, you know, all creatures on this planet, the environment we need to survive, and so forth. Um, and of course, absolute is just lying is wrong, killing is wrong. Well, you need more information than just making blanket statements like that, right? So, yes, uh, my father used to make this point. I, I don't know if he still does. He said, "You're either you're either in in favor of murder or you are not." Um, and right. I thought to myself, well, what if you come home to find your family butchered and in the process of having their corpses raped by a blood-stained man who is out of control, can't be reasoned with, and has evidently escapes an asylum and is holding a gun? Um, on one side, the emotional side of it's going to change. Of course, you may be, lose your, your mind temporarily through the huge loss. And on the other side, of course, there's a direct danger to you. And I, that's the first thing I thought of, actually, when he said that. He was trying to make a more general point about uh, capital punishment. And say it's 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 morally inconsistent to use capital punishment to 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 punish murder, which he is right about. That there there is that that seems to me to be very difficult to digest. However, there may be exceptions to that too. But I, I see the point he was trying to make. But it's very very easy, I think, to prove that the absolute side of morality is incongruent, uh, lands you in trouble. Uh, is more trouble than it's worth and is usually wrong. <laughs> so, uh, uh, or at least needs to be evaluated every time it's said, uh, because it may, maybe one day you'll discover um, a, a, an absolute moral uh, value. Maybe. There may be one out there. Uh, it is always wrong to approach a black hole. <laughs> That's not really a moral statement, but <laughs> you know, there may be something out there, but you would have to run it through this. You wouldn't be able to just assert it. So I do absolutely agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, the, the only absolutes that I would assert are logical absolutes, you know, um, that, that, that an, in, that, that a, but they're almost redundant, you know, like say that a, um, an invalid argument is wrong, you know, yes. that, that will always be true. Uh, attack is not a, 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 a valid or honest form of communication, something like that. Yeah, exactly. That's... Yeah. But that, but that's of course not really, a. uh, a statement about the physical world that that's more about a tool that we use to deduce what is right or wrong or valid or invalid. Um, okay. And then another point brought up, which I brought up at the beginning was that, uh, you know, morals and laws can be ways that we superimpose ideas onto a underlying existing structure, which of course, that's not what we're advocating here in discussing, uh, the importance of a science of morality. Um, a couple of Z days ago, I did a talk called Updating Human Values, where I basically talked about uh, how do we figure out whether a value is sustainable or not, meaning how do we figure out whether it's, you know, if positively or negatively affects everyone else. Uh, and that's basically what we're talking about here, I think. Uh, morality is a, is, a, is a framework for determining, determining this, and our values need to be in line with this morality. I think that's the distinction between morals and values. I, I think a lot of people get confused between all these words, you know, ethics, morals, and values. A value is simply, I think, as John McMurtry likes to define, a principle of preference. So basically, what what your what your own preferences are in your in your life. Do you like to compete? Do you like to cooperate? Do you eat certain types of food? 
you know, how, you know, how much do you sleep at night and all, all these different things. And th these are all questions that can be quantified in terms of uh, negative or positive consequences. And the way we do this, of course, is by applying a, a form of sci scientific morality, meaning we um, reference known physical facts about the universe and we apply them to our values to see if they're uh, in, in line. So I think that's a distinction that needs to be made here. Um, a lot of people, I think, in the movement shy away from making moral or discussing the topic of morality or they... I'm not sure why, whether they think that morality is synonymous with moral relativism. That's what it seems like to me. But if you if you frame it in the way that Harris does, in terms of the purview of science, I don't think there's really a problem here. Plus, it's also necessary to establish that uh, that our goal as a species is to maximize human well-being. You know, efficiency and sustainability and social reform are great, but what's the goal here? Right. The goal should be to reach a, you know, an absolute or as high a peak as we can on the moral landscape. Yes, um, that makes sense. Speaking of speaking of McMurtry, um, we can make his point for him rather well. Um, if anybody doesn't know who we mean, uh, there is a, a University of Guelph emeritus professor named John McMurtry who wrote a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, whose second edition you may thank our movement for, in fact, uh, according to at least his own acknowledgments in the front. Um, the basic point that he made, uh, which seems to be irreducible to me, although, of course, that's always a dangerous thing to say, is that uh, life prefers nutritious food over poison, clean air over polluted air, and uh, meaningful relationships over violence and early death. It seems pretty hard to argue against this, and I think Harris actually includes that as well in the way that you say, imagine the universe where every conscious creature is tortured to, to, towards madness, tortured so badly it goes insane, basically. You, only, you, have, you have to admit that that is bad. <laughs> and if you don't admit that's bad, then your idea of bad means nothing at all, and you probably don't understand what it means, and you're essentially probably dodging the question. Now, that's, that's exactly. what McMurtry then builds a whole economic model on this, doesn't he, on the idea that that's essentially what he calls the life ground, which I cannot be argued with. I, I really don't think it can be argued with unless you're suicidal, in which case you've already accepted that you're, you're not pro-life uh, in your own sense. You, you don't mind your own life coming to an end, in which case you're not speaking about uh, the maximization of, um, uh, of, of life quality. Now, um, he extends that, and this is where I think we can get to my, what was going to be my only comment about where we are now in terms of morals. Um, he lists arms, the cigarette industry and other uh, drug industries usually illicit as well, of course, heroin from Afghanistan as well, as essentially corruptions of produce. So the produce idea is the traditional economic idea that life will use means of life, be that fertile soil, clean air, water, all the requirements and, and nutrition and uh, other physical conditions required to generate life enhancing goods. Really, the word goods is meant by that. Um, for the maximization of and furthering of more life. So it's life using means of life for more life. And he then maintains that that has essentially been inverted and that we are now uh, using a sort of uh, a money demand, using life as means for more money demand. And this becomes very, very clear with respect to morality, particularly actually, when you consider the subject of cigarettes or armaments. These are life reducing. Uh, deliberately life reducing. They're de they're, it's, it's essentially designed to reduce life, certainly in the in the form of armaments. With cigarettes, I can probably give the benefit of the doubt that they once didn't know uh, as much as we do definitely know now, and that they got the idea from the Indians and then corrupted it and, and, and poured pesticide on the rest. And this would then lead me to where I think we are today uh, mor morality-wise, which is that we have essentially disconnected what is life enhancing from what is A, required of a society and by a society of you, and B, what we think we want in that society. And, and that's essentially part of the same condition. And the reunification of those two, uh, what really enhances life, and understanding more about how we can say that the metrics of those are understood, and how we may understand them in the future, and those practices that do in fact follow that pattern, and rather than subvert it. McMurtry makes a wonderful point about this. He says that rush you get from cigarettes is in fact the body's response system against the cigarettes as a poison. But it's been 
almost by the mind, borrowed by advertising as the, the rush and the benefits of that, even though it is, in fact, an alarm system going on. Uh, it's like finding pleasure in a burglar alarm going off in your house. And so I, I think that's where we are now, and I think that's where Harris's book attempts to get us. I wanted to ask you, Pinker, Stephen Pinker, who's, who's book is called The Better Angels of Our Nature. It's a giant 1,300-page volume. He makes the case that part of the reason why, as he calls it, violence is declined. We would have to defer that uh, to physical violence. And he is right that physical violence has declined. Yeah. Um, uh, in part comes from the rise of literacy. The idea that you become practiced at experiencing other people's viewpoints. Do you agree with that? Have you, have you come across this idea before? Uh, vaguely, I'm not. I'm not that familiar with the. Well, I haven't read the book. I'm a little. I'm somewhat familiar with his uh, his arguments, and I think most of them are fairly good ones. Like you say, though, this refers mostly to physical violence, um, not structural violence which of course is a is a much larger topic and I think more relevant um, one thing I, I remember the way he quantifies his physical violence statistics are that they're per capita or they're per person so there are fewer acts of violence occurring per person in the world although of course there's much more violent actions occurring because the human population has has gotten a lot larger so I don't know. These these are such difficult questions to answer. When, I mean, I don't know how you would test that hypothesis. Can can you explain that any further? Since you've, I think, read it. Yeah. The um, uh, the data set that he he prefers to use in at least the first third of his book is called UCDP. It's the Uppsala Conflict Data Project or Database Project. It's a free open project. Oop, I've had the good luck to go to Uppsala University actually myself. Uh, only as a visitor, I should say. Um, and uh, th this tracks the deaths per 100,000, you are right, or through war and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then he, he tracks other things as well, like the fact that people used to uh, draw swords or knives over uh, dinner and stab each other over insults. <laughs> so social mores have certainly become a little bit more, um, they, they align themselves more on the side of, well, let's not go for death right away <laughs> and do something else. But, I mean, the thing that is missing in the entire book, unfortunately, and he admits it in the Q&A on his own website as well, is that structural violence is completely ignored. He says the book is big enough as it is. And it's actually very useful. We, should, we, um, we mustn't discount his side of the argument, I think, because um, the fact that physical violence has declined, apart from one reason, are down to technological progress and down to uh, education. And those right. are extremely useful arguments. I mean, I mean, they're not just useful. They are, they are very well demonstrated. Um, where, where I part ways with them a little bit in terms of at least how it's preferable is that the main reason is given as the monopoly of violence by the state has, has disenabled I remember that, yeah. stabbing each other to death over an insult because we're so worried about going to prison or being hanged or whatever, um, which may be true. I'm sure, I'm sure our ANCAP friends would love that argument. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, although it does then mean that if you uh, remove the monopoly of violence from the state, then according to the same argument, violence is going to shoot through the roof. And <laughs> we have at least one example in the last couple of months that essentially proves that point. And unfortunately, it proves it on the libertarian uh, end. There was a website called The Silk Road. Did you come across this? I'm not. The Silk Road is a, or was at least, it's been seized by the FBI now, a centralized, brilliant eBay for drugs. You could buy anything. You could buy heroin, you could buy shrooms, which a lot of people used it for. Uh, you could buy, um, what's it called? Uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine. You know, they're all the really strong hallucinogens yeah. you just can't get on the street. But love nor money. Um, and it was run by a guy, um, it was used along with the Tor network and with Bitcoin. And libertarians love Bitcoin because it's a non um, it's a non state uh, money. It's non centralized. It fits the model rather well, and it, it has its benefits. Um, but you could use Bitcoin, and you could use Tor, the Tor browser, the Tor project browser, the anonymizing software, and essentially be absolutely untrackable. They couldn't prove that you'd paid for anything. They couldn't prove that you were even on the site, but you somehow had drugs from somewhere, and it was sold with rating systems and all the rest. Now, the problem is, uh, when the FBI stepped in and, and, and seized all the Bitcoins, which now, by the way, makes them the owner of the most Bitcoins in the world, uh, and the site itself, which has also found um, uh, other 
outlets, just like the pirate base, someone else has set up another version. One of the reasons they had arrested him, other than mass drug trafficking, uh, was that he had planned to murder two rivals and, had, and was going to pay a phenomenal amount for it. And that gives you a worrying insight into what lies just below this supposed freedom of his operation, um, at least within a market principle. The idea is not just that you could somehow uh, serve your common man, as they love to say, satisfy your fellow man in that uh, particularly uh, almost erotic way that they say that, um, a point made, by the way, rather well by the Yes Men in their second film. Um, and uh, in fact, it, 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 it very quickly becomes evident that it doesn't matter how well you're doing or how many millions you have earned. Uh, any competition deserves death and would uh, be that way were there not this, lim this ridiculous limitation of the state. I say ridiculous because you wouldn't even need the limitation if you, were, if you found yourself within a society where your survival wasn't so predicated upon beating the competition, even if you're winning. <laughs> so um, it gave me a fascinating, a, a lot to think about all at once in terms of what is in fact the, the, the morality of the market, of where we are now, and of people within a system that require one thing and, and wish for another. Um, and I, I kept thinking back to Harris's idea. So um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the general stuff I've taken from it. Um, I recommend Pinker's book certainly as a reference work. Right. Certainly with, with, with physical violence, there's some good arguments. There's some good debunkings of Freakonomics where um, I, I won't go into them, but there's some decent stuff in there on this Roe versus Wade nonsense that was in there. Um, and overall, he treats the arguments with a decent amount of respect, but it is limited to in a certain framework. So I'll leave it at there for that one. Right. I don't know what, uh, what more we want to discuss on this show. I think we've laid out a pretty good framework for rethinking uh, how we think about morality. Uh, I'll, of course, go into it more in, in the lecture that I give at, uh, at Z-Day. Um, if you had any other ideas as to what you want to touch on, otherwise we can maybe wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I, I do recommend people go and hunt down Sam Harris's, uh, I think it is on, on iTunes and at least on YouTube as well, if you don't like um, uh, iTunes, uh, Can Science Determine Human Values, which does explain um, how we can be relative about moralistic findings or that it doesn't have to be equal for everybody. A lot of people will hear people say, oh, uh, the zeitgeist movement or utopianists or whatever want the same for everyone. This is neither true on a resource base, nor is it true on a, on a moral basis. Uh, if right. everyone had exactly the same, we'd all be walking around with lumps of copper we can't use and lumps of aluminium and all the other nonsense. Um, this is not a point that's made. And the same goes is true for morality as well. Things can be different along a continuum. It doesn't have to be that everyone must hear to this code of law. That is what we have now. And uh, that is what so evidently underserves most of humanity, mm -hmm. not just between countries uh, ending up in all kinds of bizarre um, immunity situations uh, where, you know, one, one set of laws shouldn't apply to another or does, but it shouldn't, all the rest of it. Um, and on the other side, the argument that well, you can you can never say it's true for everybody, so therefore you can't say anything whatsoever. Uh, Harris does a very good job of, of talking about this. If you find yourself having to make moral arguments within the framework of global cooperation, maximization of technology, the, the breaking down of the old order, or rather the rebuilding of it uh, into something that is more equitable, more functional, uh, that, that chases all of those improvements that we uh, only appreciate in retrospect, no one would want to die at 47 of their teeth now, so it becomes a morality thing. Um, do go and check out uh, The Moral Landscape. Do, do go and check out McMurtry's Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And for the physical violence sections, at least, I would say check out Stephen Pinker. Um, I can't wait to uh, see what you have this year. It's, it's, I'm very sad that I will not be going to Toronto. It was my own self-imposed decision, purely on a, unfortunately, financial basis. But yeah. I'll, I'll have something for London. But do you have a title yet for your, for your piece, or is that a top-secret thing? I think I'm just going to simply call it a science of morality and society. So I'm just going to go over uh, Harris's thesis, but I'm going to explain why it's relevant in the context of social change, which is something that Harris doesn't really do in his book. You know, he talks about the idea of uh, the implications of understanding morality from this framework of needing to restructure our society, but it doesn't go into any specifics, obviously. And without rehashing a resource-based economy, which I'm not really going to do, I'm going to talk about key ingredients of a resource-based economy that essentially can be deduced from this empirical framework of morality. 
one distinction I want to make or one clarification I want to make is that in talking about a science of morality, it's not like it's an isolated field of science, so to speak. A science of morality would, would reference almost inevitably a sci the science of physics, chemistry and biology, because in talking about well-being, you're encompassing essentially everything we know about the physical world. Right. So in talking about uh, the most moral social system we can think of, which, in, in other words, is just a social system that best maximizes human well-being. Uh, we would need to reference everything we know in sociology, everything we know in biology, and so forth. So I'll be using a few examples such as, you know, income inequality. Social epidemiology is very clear that that you would want to see as little inequality, if not not all, uh, in order to make the society healthier. So that would be one attribute that we that we know that we need to aim for uh, in a much saner, sustainable society that maximizes human well-being. Mm. I like that. Um, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll add what I'm doing because I think it complements yours accidentally quite usefully. I have, um, I have chosen to talk about hacking culture lag. Um, culture lag, for anybody who doesn't know, is the values the way that we have them and the end, entertain them as individuals versus what's actually possible or true at that present time in society. So, for example, driverless cars have been possible since uh, actually quite a long time, but at, let, let's say at least two years. And yet we have not implemented them for various technical reasons, but mostly weird reasons like, oh, it's scary because it's taking the driver out of driving, which I heard a driving correction officer make that point in almost the same sentence as saying, like, most of crashes are caused by human error. But he couldn't marry those things together. And it's not because he's an idiot. It's he hasn't updated his values with respect to what technology can do instead of a human. Um, exactly. The question, the question becomes, how do you hack this to make it quicker? How do we catch up quicker? Because there is a, a real sense of urgency to where we are uh, in this planet. Um, we are running out very drastically of things. There are psycho, psycho, psychosocial pressures which are building up uh, at a rate that are, uh, is extremely unnecessary. And, of course, if we want to mitigate um, suffering, we would rather do it sooner rather than later. So the question becomes, how do we do that? Um, and I'll be referencing things like militainment, the idea that um, a lot of the, the values that we have now are reinforced through uh, products such as video games, which is essentially the same as, 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 as arms uh, are sold to armies. These are arms, fake arms sold to children um, and to, in fact, young adults as well. But then showing how some people have become activists within the militainment community and log in and do virtual uh, exercises in reminding people that there are people dying in Iraq right now for the oil to make the systems and to get the minerals to make the playstations upon which the fake battles to prepare you for the acceptance of and possible involvement in further wars is conducted. And to, to have that loop and to, and to suggest a couple of other ideas. I've got a couple of ideas that I think uh, hopefully will appeal to people who may not even be part of our movement, but really want to have some social change, want to do a bit of emotional engineering, um, honest emotional engineering, and, um, and, and uh, try to speed up this, this slow evolution, this almost linear way that we educate ourselves. So it'll be interesting to see how those complement each other when, they, when we're done. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a fascinating topic. I can't wait to see what you, you'll, you put together. Tell me, you're, you're at the main event in Toronto. Um, do you have the date and the time again, just so people who are listening know? Yeah, and tickets are available as well. I believe the main event day is March 15th. Let me just double check that. Saturday, March 15th from uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Toronto. And tickets are available. I think you can go to the main Zeitgeist Moment website and purchase them from Eventbrite. Yeah, so I'll be speaking. Peter Joseph will be giving a talk, and also John McMurtry will be speaking. So it'll be nice to have him there. That's been confirmed. What a wonderful addition to uh, this show, given the fact we've touched on his work again. Oh, how wonderful. You must give him my regards. Definitely. Um, for anybody in the London area, um, we have gone quite big this year as well. Um, we've continued a, um, an idea that Jim Phillips of our education uh, chapter started last year, which is to invite external speakers who are actually part of other movements, uh, movements that may not even match our own, but have a piece of the puzzle to contribute or have a, a viewpoint that must be entertained and must be, I think, assimilated. Um, and this year we've got somebody from the Center for Sustainable Development, no, sorry, the Center for a uh, Steady State Economy. And we have, this is very interesting because it also speaks to how you update values through culture 
uh, Raoul Reynolds of the UK band Enter Shikari, who are sort of million selling um, metalers. Well, not really. They're sort of experimental, halfway between dubstep and metal and a few other bits and bobs, who broadly and openly and unequivocally sort of support our direction in the sense of supporting employing the scientific method for social concern. So it should be quite interesting. Tickets are on sale for that too. And it's also the 15th of March. Um, and it'll be at the, in Red Lion Square at the, oh man, I've forgotten it. Conway Hall. It'll be at Conway Hall in Red Lion Square. Um, and so that should be interesting as well. Um, if anybody has a local event to add to the roster, because of course you are free to organize your own event, uh, if you are confident that you can stand up to the questions of audience members who turn up, <laughs> um, you can submit your event on zdayglobal.org, or you can get in touch with us through our Facebook page or through the zeitgeistmovement.com page, through the contact form there, um, and we will collate and list those various events. There are typically between two and 300. I think the maximum we had was something like 500 events one year. And they range from simple screenings all the way through to eight-hour lectures like indeed the one in Toronto will be this year. Um, right. So yes, join us for that. Um, we hope you have found some interest or some usefulness in this uh, discussion of where science and morality intersect or whether they were even ever apart. And I'll thank the listeners. This has been Ben McLeish and I'll pass over to you, Matt, to close. Thank you very much for co-hosting this show with me, Ben. Uh, like Ben said, I hope this was an enlightening show, and I'll be expanding upon these ideas more so in my Z-Day talk in uh, Toronto in mid-March. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Have a great one. Thank you. It's in my interest that people don't suffer. I don't want someone bleeding to death from AIDS on my doorstep. For, not just for their sake. For mine, I don't want that. George Bernard Shaw, when he ran for office in London, said there should be no more houses built for the working classes without baths. And, and it was objected to him by the Tories and the Conservatives. They said, why give them baths? The poor are so ignorant and stupid, they won't even know how to use them. Uh, they'll keep coal in them. Uh, they don't deserve baths. You're wasting your compassion on them. He said, I don't want them to have a bath for their sake. I want them to have baths for my sake. <laughs> That's the right mix of self-interest and morality. And it works too, it works, it works. Whereas religious exhortation and telling people, telling children that if, if they don't do the right thing, they'll go to terrifying punishments or unbelievable rewards, that's making a living lying to children. <laughs>